it's, it's not common where you see someone um, about to be killed. Two of the accused were blaming each other. Both wanted to be one of the robbers as opposed to the one who was the actual shooter. Our task was to identify which one of these suspects was potentially the killer. It's the first time I've heard a judge tell the jury after their verdict that they were naive and gullible. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Imagine you're an associate professor in the athletic department at a university, and one day you get a phone call from the police asking you to help solve a violent crime. Well, that's exactly what happened to Susan Tupling. Tupling's specialty is sports biomechanics, looking at human movement in a sports context so that athletes from beginners to pros can have more success sooner and fewer potential injuries. At the end of the 19th century, thanks to the development of a faster shutter speed, Edward Moybridge did a famous series of photographs. This was the birth of movies and the birth of biomechanics, because for the first time, human movement could be studied frame by frame. But none of this prepared Susan Tupling when out of the blue, the police called. There had been a homicide, and they wanted to find out about the heights of these potential suspects from, and they had a video of it. A homicide? A video? Uh, wait a minute. Our story begins around 4.30 on a dark winter morning. The police have answered an emergency call at a variety store. The store clerk had been shot dead. We went into the store initially to have a quick look at the body, to get a feel for the, what this uh, situation was about. And we learned that there was a video camera within the store mounted up above the cash register area. Uh, we're hopeful that the tape is running and that the tape is uh, good enough quality to capture what's happened. But there is a problem. The surveillance tape is on a six hour loop before it records over itself and the VCR is locked in a back room office. So I had one of the officers uh, smash the glass in that window to get access to it and retrieve the tape. Exhibit A, a surveillance tape. The tape is sent to a police lab with special video equipment. Outside, Fatima Perez arrives to pick up her son as planned. Detectives try to break his death to her gently. Just as the tragedy is sinking in, a TV camera crew is upon her. Angel Perez, her son, was 27. Being a dutiful son, he still lived at home, helping to support his mother and siblings. When he was laid off as a plumber's assistant, rather than go on welfare, Angel took a minimum wage job working in a nearby variety store. The night in question, he'd been working the midnight shift. Between midnight and three, he worked with the store owner. After three, Angel was on his own. Now he was dead. As with all homicides, Angel Perez's body is sent to the morgue to be autopsied. 
the pathologist will determine exactly how the store clerk died. The cause of death is attributable to a shotgun wound. The pellets were found mainly on the frontal portion of the skull and facial bones. A snowstorm of lead fragments is associated with the pellets within the head. And if we look at this next X-ray, there are a large number of pellets embedded in the left hand and wrist. The effect of powder and unburnt powder against the bone of the skull and would indicate that the gun was discharged from a close range. Th that the individual's injuries are quite compatible with him lying on the ground with his left hand and wrist close to the side of his head, face down in a non-offensive position. The conclusion? Angel wasn't defending himself. It was an execution-style murder. At the murder scene, forensic identification officers are particularly interested in a footprint on the store's Formica countertop. Normally, when we think of clues, we think of fingerprints. But in reality, footprints help solve more crimes. Taking footprint impressions is usually a straightforward procedure, not this time. Somehow in trying to transfer the footprint to tape, it vanishes. It's not in the tape and has disappeared from the Formica counter. This phenomenon is rare, but not unheard of among footprint examiners. Meanwhile, police have viewed the surveillance video. The good news is that it shows the crime. The bad news is how grainy it is. The quality of video uh, that we receive from stores, banks, whatever, is, is very bad quality because these tapes are played over and over and over again, and sometimes they're not the best quality video tapes. I'm able to improve the brightness, the contrast. I can filter. We can help to alleviate the background noise. What we're trying to do is sharpen the image, which can identify either jackets, footwear, or the faces. Even using digital enhancement, the videotape can only be cleaned up marginally. We knew that we were not going to be able to facially identify anyone from the video. And we also felt that we could not tell the skin color of the individuals, nor the sex of the individuals. If Goche tells the press how little he knows about the perpetrators, it'll give the felons a psychological boost. But given the violent nature of the crime, the media is all over the police, clamoring for details. In the end, he decides to broadcast the video as a special bulletin. This will give him a chance to enlist the public's help without subjecting himself to a media scrum. The videotape you are about to see is the real thing, the actual videotape of the murder as narrated by Detective Goche. To protect the innocent, the name of the store and the name of the victim have been bleeped out. The videotape you are about to see will show the store clerk walk towards the front of the store and then out of the camera view. Seconds later, you will see suspect number one enter the store carrying a long barrel firearm. The suspect immediately walks toward Mr. At this time, suspect number one shoots Mr. in the head, killing the store clerk. Suspects number two and number three enter the store carrying empty garbage cans. You will see that they now are joined by suspect number one near the store counter. Suspects number two and number three then jump over the counter and ransack the cabinets, stealing a quantity of cigarettes. Three suspects then leave the store via the same front door. Suspect number one, dark color clothing, a waist length coat, a hat and bandana are worn over the face. This person is wearing dark gloves. Suspect number two is wearing a black color hip length hooded coat. The Detroit Red Wings logo is on the center of the back. Suspect number three is wearing a black waist length hooded coat and below that, in the center of the jacket, is the Bulls logo. 
The Metropolitan Toronto Police request the help of the public in solving this brutal execution-style murder. A picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, a videotape, Exhibit A, raised a thousand questions. Though the videotape of the robbery murder couldn't immediately identify any of the suspects, Detective Gauthier knew it was crucial to the investigation. It's, it's not common that you see something like this where you see someone uh, about to be killed and you're watching the tape knowing that someone's about to be killed and you see them in, in real life and you know that in five seconds they're gone. The videotape showed a car's headlights in the store's front window. Someone else had pulled into the plaza that night. From viewing the rest of the tape, detectives determined no one else had entered the store. Who would be at the plaza at that time of night? There was nothing open in the plaza except the store. The only other thing that is accessible is the ATM machine in the bank. We contacted the bank to find out whether or not anybody had used that machine throughout the early morning hours. When we did find, in fact, an individual at about that time, when we spoke to him, he then related a story to us about what he had seen when he arrived at the plaza. This is what the witness told investigators he saw. During his special bulletin, Detective Goche had also broadcast information about the red car. A police officer called homicide after seeing the TV broadcast to report he'd had the abandoned car towed to a pound. The car, it turned out, belonged to a woman named Andrea Goodwin. This seemed to fit nicely with a Crime Stoppers tip investigators received that the perpetrators in the murder robbery were two men and a woman. But under questioning, Andrea Goodwin claimed she knew nothing about any robbery. She said when she'd picked up her car, she'd found garbage cans, a gun, and cartons of cigarettes. Not knowing where they'd come from, they dumped the cigarettes and the garbage cans by the side of the road and tossed the gun into a dumpster. Investigators recovered the cigarettes and the garbage cans, but the gun was never recovered. Well, the shotgun had gone to the Pickering land site. Those are vast, vast properties. It's an impossible task to try and find something that size as a sawed-off shotgun in a vast expanse like that. If Andrea Goodwin was telling the truth, how had her car ended up as a getaway car? Andrea Goodwin said she'd lent it for the night to her boyfriend, Wallace Avery. This was his story. He had rented the car to a guy named Hugh Goff in exchange for crack cocaine. Then he had gone off to do the rock. He swore he was telling the truth. What gave Detective Goche pause was learning that Avery had just been released from prison for armed robbery. He seemed certain by his background, he. Uh would be somebody that would be apt to do this. We spent days analyzing the story of this woman's boyfriend, comparing it to what we knew from the scene and other information that had come in. As investigators checked out Avery's story, they also searched for Hugh Goff, the man who had allegedly rented the red car that night. They couldn't find Goff, but they tracked down his girlfriend. Under questioning, she reluctantly admitted that hours after the murder, she'd driven Goff to New York City so he could make his escape. As American colleagues tried to locate Goff in New York City, detectives in Toronto received a number of Crime Stoppers tips about a guy named Sherwin Alexander. Alexander was brought in for questioning. Alexander admitted he was involved in the robbery, but he swore he was not the murderer. According to Alexander, he was the one wearing the Chicago Bulls jacket. His 17-year-old friend was wearing the Red Wings jacket and Hugh Goff in the black jacket was the shooter. Case solved? Nah. 
According to Goff's girlfriend on the drive to New York City, Goff had told her a totally different story. Goff admitted he was involved in the robbery, but swore that Sherwin Alexander was the one who shot the store clerk. In Goff's account, he also had the 17-year-old in the Red Wings jacket. But Goff claimed he was the one wearing the Bulls jacket, and Alexander was the shooter in the black jacket. Two of the accused were blaming each other. They were admitting they were involved in, in the event, but both wanted to be one of the robbers as opposed to the one who was the actual shooter. Who was telling the truth? The height difference between the two was about eight inches. Could investigators use that difference to single out the shooter? Remember the footprint that disappeared? The investigators from Metro, they brought me the full counter. So when I got an electric saw and I cut it down to size, to this size, so that it was a workable size. So the first thing that I do, I'm going to capture the footwear on the Arborite top with the camera. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to completely wipe off with alcohol the footwear impression. With the camera, I'm going to capture the exact same area. And then I'm, I'm going to digitize it so that I can analyze it with the computer. Having now captured uh, both images, number one being the Arborite top with the footwear impression, and number two being just the Arborite top on its own, I'm going to subtract one image from the other and I'm left with the footwear impression. The print seemed to come from a size 12 Converse sneaker. Detectives wondered if knowing that could help determine whether Goff or Alexander was in the bull's jacket. By a process of elimination, the other one would be the shooter in the black jacket. That's when they got hold of Susan Tupling. But the idea was, could I from that know how tall this potential subject was? And of course I couldn't because people of all different heights have size 12 shoes if it was a size 12 shoe. So I couldn't do it from there. Tupling used biomechanics to study human movement in the lab, but would it work to catch Angel Perez's killer? Who had been the shooter, Goff or Alexander? Detective Groce was relying on biomechanics to pinpoint the killer. Our main focus was to find the one with the gun. So the biomechanical was everything to us to establish that we had the right individual as being the trigger man. From the early days of Edward Moybridge's photos through contemporary biomechanic studies, the subjects were often in no clothes or tight fitting clothes. That was perfect for Tupling's academic studies, but in the robbery murder, the suspects were in hoods and hats and bulky clothes. Then there was the camera angle. Lab studies were done at eye level. The angle from the store surveillance camera from above foreshortened heights. Another problem, which image of the suspects should they try to measure? They were always running, uh, crouching down, reaching over to grab things off of shelves. And so they never stood perfectly still for us. And that's how you measure someone's height. They have to stand perfectly upright for you. And these suspects, um, as in most human movements, you just don't conform to that sort of situation. By examining the video frame by frame, Tupling found two locations where they could see a suspect's head and feet. And the suspect stood straight up. The idea is to, to find when he's standing vertical. He has to be on one leg or two legs standing straight up. And just before he jumps over, he is standing as vertical as he's going to be. That's about it right there. But if we could calibrate the volume that they were in, set up some sort of an X, Y, Z axis, a big grid within the whole store, then we could sort of use our three-dimensional techniques that we use within the lab all the time to make an estimate of how tall the different suspects were. Tupling's colleague had developed a technique using a calibrated frame and moving it around the store. When the numbers from the various XYZ coordinates were crunched into the computer, 
it essentially turned the 2D image into a 3D determination of volume. From the volume, they hoped they could figure out the heights of the three suspects. Then the results were analyzed and double-checked to ensure accuracy. We concluded there were three unique heights uh, with quite large differences between them. So between the shortest and the middle suspects, there was four inches difference. And between the middle and the tallest, we had six inches difference. In the video, the suspect with the black coat was the one who uh, carried the gun into the store and performed the shooting. And our data indicated that he was the shortest of the three suspects. So Alexander, the shortest guy, was the shooter in the black jacket. Based on all this, this is what investigators think happened on the night in question. After trading crack for the red car, Goff picked up Alexander and the 17-year-old and drove to the variety store. There they waited outside watching. The last customer left around a quarter after three. Alexander, the gunman, entered first. Then Goff and the 17-year-old entered, Goff wearing the bull's jacket. Goff and the 17-year-old were convicted of armed robbery. Sherwin Alexander was charged with first-degree murder. The prosecution contended that the killing of Angel Perez was an execution-style murder. The defense argued that Alexander's gun had gone off accidentally. Because the gun had never been recovered, the jury refused to rule out the possibility the gun had discharged accidentally. In the end, Sherwin Alexander's charge was reduced and he was sentenced to manslaughter. Angel's mother and siblings were furious with what they considered the leniency of the sentences. I can't explain why the jury came back with a manslaughter uh, on, on to us what was clearly an execution case. It's the first time I've heard a judge tell the jury after their verdict that they were naive and gullible, were his words. I don't think I thought of the human factor initially. We were so wrapped up with making sure everything was so accurate and so precise. And then you, it sort of hit you. But this is, this is the human factor. This is what it was all about. The art of moving pictures and the science of biomechanics had been born together at the turn of the century. 100 years later, they came together again to decipher a video and help investigators convict a murderer. Take a rich tycoon. He's one and only child. The tycoon's second wife. Add a $2 million will. Mutual suspicion. And a rookie document examiner. It takes the same kind of examination skills to determine if a document is genuine as it does to pronounce it a forgery. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Think of famous signatures, Napoleon, Shakespeare, and Michael Jordan, each worth a fortune. Yet this signature, unknown except to his immediate family, would be worth $2 million. Exhibit A, the last will and testament of Mr. Dennis Lloyd.
Dennis Lloyd was a self-made man, devoting himself to making money. By the time he was 60, he owned extensive real estate and a lucrative paper factory. In the town of Markham, Ontario, he was a rich fish in a medium-sized pond. But as a person, Dennis Lloyd was cold and distant. He rarely visited with his grown-up son, Barry, and Barry's family. And he could be curt and insensitive to his second wife, Carolyn. The first time Dennis brought Carolyn to spend Christmas with Barry's family, he only succeeded in creating a rivalry between them. After that, Dennis's affection seemed to swing between Carolyn and Barry. One month favoring one, the next month the other. This was the situation when Dennis suffered a serious heart attack. He was rushed to the hospital. When his condition improved, he refused to think about death or talk about his will. Then three weeks later, he suddenly died of cardiac arrest. In their moment of grief, there was a temporary softening of their long-standing enmity. But a few weeks later, Carolyn and Barry were summoned by the estate's executor to a reading of Dennis's will. Dennis Lloyd's will left $20,000 annually to Carolyn but the bulk of his $2 million estate went to Barry, his wife and son. Carolyn was shocked. Barry, of course, was delighted, as much by the clear acknowledgement of his dad's love as by the money. Zachary Bloom, Carolyn's lawyer, examined the will. He was suspicious because the will was seven years old but a search for more recent will proved fruitless. Dennis Lloyd died in March. Despite Carolyn's dismay at the will, her sorrow was so profound that it took four months before she could enter Dennis's private bedroom. Finally, she asked her longtime gardener to help her pack her husband's effects. When the gardener went to clear out a dresser, Carolyn told him Dennis never kept anything valuable in it. But she was wrong. Hidden in a Bible was a new will. A will that would be the centerpiece of a huge legal battle. A winner-take-all battle between stepmother and son. Based on this, the parties reconvened at the executor's office. Carolyn came accompanied by her lawyer, Zachary Bloom, as well as by the two witnesses to the new will, Dennis's friend and real estate agent Stanley Pavel, and Cassandra Edmonds, a family friend who at one time had been Dennis's executive secretary. To protect his interests, Barry brought along his attorney. The new will dated the previous Thanksgiving left $500,000 to Barry and his family. The rest of Dennis Lloyd's real estate holdings and paper factory went to Carolyn. This time it was Carolyn's turn to be delighted. Barry was incensed. 
More than that, he was suspicious. The previous Christmas, his father had made him certain promises about his estate. Barry was adamant that his father would never have hidden this new will from him. When people have suspicions about documents, there's a place to check them out. At the Center of Forensic Sciences, there's a whole section that examines documents. Using a variety of machines and techniques, document experts can investigate and analyze everything from ransom notes to checks made with invisible ink to questions of cheating on university exams. Uh, the student hadn't cheated, the professor was wrong. One of the main areas is document examination. Everything from watermarks and typeface to handwriting and signatures. Greg Dawson is the head of the document section, but at the time he was just a rookie. It was assigned to me because they thought it was fairly straightforward. It was a simple one page document, a little bit of typewriting on it and one signature. Um, what could be so more simple than that? Uh, the just one word, D. Lloyd, was written. Um, combination of six letters. Six letters worth two million dollars. So the resource was there for Barry to authenticate the will. One major problem. A clause at the bottom of the will that said, if any beneficiary should contest any of the bequests herein to him or her, then such person or persons is not to receive the said bequest. In other words, if Barry contested the will and lost, he would lose everything. Was it worth the gamble? Did Barry really have grounds for suspicion? Or was it just sour grapes, jealousy that in his final act, his father had chosen Carolyn over him? After weighing it over, Barry decided to risk it all. Barry went to court against his stepmother. Two million dollars, winner take all. The issue, whether Dennis Lloyd's new will was genuine or a forgery. If it was a forgery, Barry would get it all. If it was genuine, Carolyn would keep it all. It was to be a civil trial decided by a judge. Given that a deceased cannot testify, an exception is made in cases concerning wills allowing both sides to give hearsay evidence. Barry Lloyd took the stand. The heart of his case was a promise his father had made him the previous Christmas. While Carolyn was off in Italy, his father spent the holidays with Barry's family. Dennis told Barry about having spent his whole life worrying about money. Now he was concerned what would happen to it when he died. Dennis confided to his son that he planned to leave Carolyn $20,000 annually, but he wanted his paper factory and the rest of his $2 million estate to go to his flesh and blood. Barry truly believed that his father would never have changed his mind without saying something. Plus, there were a lot of strange circumstances surrounding this latest will. For instance, why would his father, who had never been religious, hide his will inside a Bible? And why, if this new will was dated the previous Thanksgiving, did it only come to light four months after his father's death? Dennis's friend, Stanley Pavel, provided the answer. The previous Thanksgiving, Stanley and his wife, Dennis and Carolyn, and Cassandra Edmonds had all gone on a fun weekend junket to Las Vegas. Though Dennis didn't gamble, he loved to watch Stanley gamble. On that Saturday night, Dennis suddenly whispered he wanted Stanley to come up to his hotel suite right away. As they entered the room, they saw Carolyn and Cassandra, who had just come back from shopping. On the pretense they had to catch an early dinner in show, Dennis urged Carolyn to get ready as quickly as possible. 
Then he took a piece of paper out of his briefcase. It was his will, and he wanted them to witness it. Dennis made them both promise not to mention anything to Carolyn. He wanted the new will to be a surprise. That was why Carolyn hadn't known about the new will until after Dennis Lloyd's death when it fell out of the Bible. Cassandra Edmonds confirmed Stanley Pavel's story. She testified that as Dennis's secretary, she had heard him criticize Barry for thinking money grew on trees, adding that Barry would be in for a big surprise if he thought he was going to inherit the old man's money. It all made sense, more than Barry Lloyd wanted to admit. But Barry wasn't about to give up. He was suspicious about certain spelling mistakes in the will. For instance, the city of Markham, M-A-R-K-H-A-M, the only city Dennis Lloyd had lived in since coming over from England, was misspelled. More inexplicable, his father's last name, Lloyd, L-L-O-Y-D, was misspelled in the very first line. Dennis was a meticulous man, so why would he have left these mistakes in? Zachary Bloom testified that he and his wife had also gone to Las Vegas Thanksgiving weekend, and that he had accidentally run into Dennis Lloyd. Dennis didn't trust most lawyers, but he trusted Bloom. He insisted Bloom accompany him to a local notary public. He wanted to prepare a new will. Bloom told the court, the Las Vegas notary public was neither the most meticulous nor smartest man. This was the first time he'd ever met Dennis Lloyd, and he'd never even heard of Markham, Ontario, hence the spelling errors. Barry found this more plausible than he cared to admit, but he wasn't ready to give up. It was now time to hear about the examination of the will itself. Dawson first checked the will to make sure nothing had been added or erased, it hadn't. Then he checked the watermark on the paper. If you hold up good paper to the light, you'll see a watermark, which is how paper is registered. Wills are usually prepared on good paper. The question was, is it registered or not? If it is, then it'll give us a date at which that watermark first came on the market. And if the will is dated 1978, for example, or 77, and I find that watermark never came on the market until 1980, we know right away this has been a backdated document. The watermark was called Old Liverpool Bond. Checking the standard reference book, Dawson discovered it was not registered. This neither ruled the paper in nor out. Next, Dawson checked the typeface to see if it could be traced back to a particular typewriter. The typeface, again, was very unusual. Um, we still haven't ever seen a typeface such as this. Um, the, all of the lowercase letters in, in this will were in script style. That is, it, it kind of looks like it's connected. It looks like it's um, very rounded handwriting, where each letter touches the next letter, um, except for the capital letters. All capital letters were in a monotone style. Even to this day, Dawson has never seen another typeface like it. The uniqueness of both the watermark and the typeface could be argued for or against authenticity. It would now come down to one thing and one thing only, whether the signature was real or a forgery. Two million dollars was riding on it. This is one of Dennis Lloyd's known signatures. This is the one on the will. Were they the same? What do you think? Two million dollars, winner take all. It was now time for Greg Dawson's moment in the sun. Would he conclude the new will was genuine or a forgery? The judge added that if it was a forgery, then someone had committed a criminal act. There was no in between. 
Handwriting is actually more brain writing. It involves the subconscious. Your mind tells your hand what to write, but one seldom actually thinks, how do I make these characters? These hand movements are ingrained in us when we're quite young. Take an average classroom. Kids start to learn how to write trying to model the handwriting above the blackboard. But even after a very short time, when a teacher collects a class's papers, she can probably identify each student without looking at the name because they've already begun to place their individual trademarks on their handwriting, a combination of artistic ability and physical ability that makes it uniquely theirs. By the time we've graduated high school, our handwriting is basically set. The nuts and bolts of what Greg Dawson does as a document examiner involves the careful study of one set of writings compared to another set and looking at the minutia in order to determine whether or not they were written by the same person. The first thing I do is to begin um, examining the signature under the microscope and while I'm looking at it under the microscope I'm drawing what I'm seeing. So I get uh, a fairly intimate knowledge of the signature and by looking at it under the microscope and drawing it myself it's a, a working habit that forces me to concentrate and, and, and focus on the, the details of the writing. Greg Dawson carefully compared the signatures. The question signature starts here, uh, and it begins here with a blunt beginning stroke, and it comes straight down across here, up, then down, and then it terminates out here. Right? In the known signature, you see it gets an upstroke here, across here, 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 down, and then over this way and much more quickly done. See the same movement in here, across, up, around, and then across here. And it ends with kind of a tapering stroke. This one ends with quite an abrupt stroke there. Again in here, it starts again here with another blunt beginning stroke and then comes up. The pen is lifted right here. At this point, the pen is raised off the page and it's reaffixed to the page again at that particular location and then carries on. In the known Lloyd signatures, it's beginning actually in this direction, it comes up, it goes up very quickly, and then quickly down. And you can see the same thing here, it's just up, no pen lift in that particular location. It's an example of a, of a pen lift in an unusual or odd location. Then there was the question of slope. You notice that it sloped just a little bit more than to the left than the, quest, than the no, known signatures she is almost vertical, just a little wee bit off the 90 degrees. And these ones here were significantly more to the left than any of the other knowns that I had. One other feature was intriguing. Uh, it's location above the line. You notice that this signature is written quite a bit above the line. And the two knowns that I have here is pretty much right on, written right on this line. And, th and the same with the signature down here. Based on these factors, Greg Dawson was ready to render his decision. The features here are, are classic indications of forgery. Um, and, and in fact, in terms of skill of a forgery, this isn't even a very good job. Following Dawson's testimony, all hell broke loose. Stanley Pavel announced he wanted to come clean and confess he's part in the conspiracy. Cassandra started screaming it was a lie. Zachary Bloom tried to calm everyone. Carolyn fainted. All four were charged with conspiracy to commit fraud. Carolyn Lloyd swore the mastermind behind the whole conspiracy was lawyer Zachary Bloom, and that he'd come up with the idea of hiding the will in the Bible. For her cooperation, Bloom offered her a million dollars, the family home, and a new car every two years. Stanley Pavel said he was offered $50,000, and since he was a real estate agent, Bloom promised him the commission from the sale of Dennis Lloyd's businesses. As for Bloom and Cassandra, investigators discovered they were lovers. They owned a small money-losing golf course together, and Bloom personally owed almost $200,000 to his law partners. If the will had gone through, 
they would have gotten Dennis Lloyd's paper business, which they planned to sell to pay off their debts. There was some uh, suggestion that uh, this will was drafted in Detroit and that they had had a, an expert forge the signature. If they did have an expert forger, um, they didn't get their money's worth, that's for sure. The upshot of all this? Carolyn was sentenced to one day in prison and a year's probation. Stanley Pavel received the same sentence plus three months for perjury. Cassandra Edmonds was sentenced to three years in prison, but because of medical reasons, never served time. And lawyer Zachary Bloom was disbarred and sentenced to four, 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 four year, years in prison. After all these years, this, this case is probably the most memorable one that I've had. And it brought the whole excitement of Forensic Document Examiner right to the fore for me. It, that case solidified my interest in this discipline, and I knew after doing that one, I'd never leave this work. As for Barry Lloyd, by contesting the will, he thwarted a greedy scam and inherited his father's estate. He finally got a chance to bask in the knowledge that his father had truly loved him. It's amazing how much trouble can be caused by six little 